Tim Besley, the Queen came to Ellisie and asked her a famous question. Why didn't you guys see it? And I gather you're one of the people who wrote a letter which said, quote, a failure of the collective imagination of many bright people. Not good enough, is it? Missing the economic meltdown. How could you have missed it? Not you, singular, but you, plural. You guys, the economists. Well, I, I, you say it's the economists, but there was a lot more people involved here than just the economists. I mean, there was a whole series of policymakers, analysts, and people who are looking at this, dare I say lawyers, who were involved in the process of analysing a series of issues. Um, the fact is that this is the kind of once-in-a-generation event. Uh, and, you know, once-in-a-generation events are things we learn from, we have learned from in history, and hopefully we don't let things repeat themselves. Well, you plan the next mistake. Uh, well, there will be another mistake. There's always another mistake. We learn from the past, we move on, there'll be another mistake. It'll hopefully not be of the same kind. Do you think politics plays a bit of a part in mistakes? Because you were on this Monetary Policy Committee, which is kind of an independent body, mm -hmm. and it's no secret, I think, that you were pushing for increased in interest rates and so on, which is a very pop unpopular political manoeuvre. Mm -hmm. Is it tricky to engage in that kind of work in a politically sensitive context. Did you find that when you were doing it? Well, I mean, it's certainly harder to do economics in a politically charged context than to do it in a sort of uh, dispassionate and independent way. But uh, I, I think it's fair to say, and that comes back to the quote that you, you, you drew out from my Queen's letter, there, there was a whole host of parties, all in a sense, wanting to make a set of similar and interrelated points that ended up as a major error, a collective error. Yeah, yeah. And at the moment, for example, keeping interest rates very low, is there a serious risk about inflation which kind of politicians don't want to hear about because they reckon it'll be on somebody else's watch? Is that part of the dynamic of politics here? Well, I mean, the, the good thing about asking an independent committee to set interest rates is that it's not the business of politicians to make these judgments. Um, of course, whether the technocrats who are in charge of this make the right judgments, we will have to see in, in retrospect. But the fact is, I think they're very concerned about the possibility that if they leave interest rates too low for too long, there will be an inflationary consequence. But the thing I think we can all be reassured about is that that won't be a decision made by politicians. And that's a good thing we should be reassured by, because it seems to be quite a political decision that's made, but we've handed it over to your own word, technocrats. Is that yes. uncomfortable? Well, it's uncomfortable perhaps for the politicians on, on, on the occasions they feel they know better than the technocrats. But by and large, I would say for areas where technical expertise is important, and I imagine as a lawyer you would say courts have a role to play to bring their technical expertise to bear, I think there are domains in which economists think they have the technical expertise to, to bring to the table and, and setting interest rates for keeping inflation low is one of those areas. Yeah, and for all its faults, the democracy isn't authoritarian. And you've written a fantastic idea about the pillars of stability, the pillars of prosperity. Mm. And a place like China doesn't come out of it so well. Can big economies succeed without democratising? We hard to say China hasn't succeeded to a point. I think what you do by not having um, the, the, the right institutional framework, particularly the set of checks and balances, the rule of law and the other things that I, I would say in the long run are essential to success, you expose yourself to a series of risks, things that could go wrong that will be very hard to cope with without having those institutions. Now China is made, has made a, very series, a series of very sensible long run economic decisions. But at some point in, in the future, there will be some shocks and other things it has to deal with where it may be much more challenging because it hasn't got the institutional environment in place. So that doesn't necessitate democracy. It requires other stuff, but it doesn't necessitate democracy. Well, I, I, as you saw in my last answer, I'm reluctant to use the term democracy. It means very different things to different people. For some people, it just means elections. For me, and much more importantly, it means checks and balances, independent judiciary, an independent parliamentary structure that really scrutinizes what the executive is doing. And, and the risk, if I, if I was to say to you, yes, you need democracy, everyone would say, oh, that means holding elections. Holding elections is, to me, only a small part of what democracy achieves. And the really uh, important part is that, uh, that oversight of the executive and making sure that decisions are subject to the right kind of analysis and, 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 and accountability from independent bodies as well as elective bodies. And if David Cameron said, look, we're flummoxed and I'm fed up with this Osborne guy, Tim, you can be a lord, will you do it? Would you like to be Chancellor of the Exchequer? Uh, no. Um, I, you know, I, I think one thing we, we do as academics is we learn that we're good at some things and we're less good at other things. And the idea that just because we're good at publishing articles in journals and analysing economic problems, we'd also be good chancellors of the Exchequer would be a, a major conceit. And I, I'm not going to subscribe to it. Tim Besley, thank you for subjecting yourself to the Gear 2 grilling. <laughs> thank you.